John Sinclair I'm a poet from Detroit I got a new album on Iron Man Records called Mohawk with Steve Fly well the poems on this record are from an elongated work in verse called Always Know a Book of Monk each poem in this elongated work of verse is based on a particular song recorded by Thorne his funk, many of his own compositions. So this is like 10 of them. It's in four parts, this Book of Monk, corresponding to his recordings for Blue Note, Prestige, Riverside, and Columbia Records. So his recording career was broken into four parts, so the book is in four parts. I used to write poems like that when I first started, where you had to figure out what it was about. <laughs> and then I studied with Charles Olson, and then I was also influenced by my friend and mentor, Edward Sanders, to just say what you wanted to say, and bring in whatever you wanted to bring in. You know, I try to incorporate the specific meanings in the work rather than behind them, you know what I mean? Uh, well, I like the long poem called An Oscar for Treadwell, in which I try to incorporate and uh, infuse the poem with the excitement of the period in the early 40s when Charlie Parker and Thelonious Monk and Dizzy Gillespie were inventing modern music on the stand, you know, in a nightclub in Harlem during the war. So I like that one a lot. That's a long one, harder to take, but <laughs> there's an ode to my dear departed friend Stevenson Palfey of my melancholy baby. He was a filmmaker in uh, New Orleans who, after the flood in 2005, he blew his brains up. So I wrote a poem for him. I don't know. I like all of them. If I didn't like them, I would suppress them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I recorded my part at the E1 studio in Amsterdam under the direction of Steve the Fly. He has a relationship with the studio and he does something almost every Monday. He goes over and makes something. So I had finally finished the first of the four books of the Book of Monk. I had all the poems finished and all in order because they go in order of the way the monk recorded them. They start with his first recordings and they go to his last recording and each one is numbered in terms of its position in the sequence. <laughs> it's a real mental patient work, but it's what I do. <laughs> Finished the first 20 in 1985. And now in 2013, I'd finished second, I mean finished. So each one, see when I compose them, I don't compose them in order, I compose them uh, according to the inspiration I get. See it's an interesting work, I don't know if you want to go into all this, but it's an interesting work to me because the poems are already titled. Each poem goes with a particular piece of music by Monk. And when I compose a poem, I play that piece of music in a loop. I play it over and over again so I get to correct rhythms and feelings and everything into the poem. Hopefully, I try. I'll listen to some music, I'll get an idea, and it'll go with a I title of one of these poems, and then I'll work on that poem. It might be number 135. <laughs> but to present them, I want them in order. So it took me a long time to finish the second 20. There was one that I didn't finish for a long time. <laughs> so anyway, I finally got them all done and I wanted to record them. 
because another part of my project is as I finish each section, I want to record it without music, just playing, to have a record of it. So we went to the studio just before I left, and we spent a day, an afternoon, and I recorded these 20 poems in order. And then I left him with Steve, and while I was gone, he would go back on his Mondays and fuck with them, you know? And he picked out the 10 that he wanted to work with, and he added the music to them himself. He's a drummer, but also a DJ. So he made up the parts that he thought would go with the poems. I thought it was brilliant what he did. I'm extremely happy with this project. In terms of an ordinary, not ordinary, but a normal, <laughs> where you have a band and a studio and all that. I mean, this is so, for me, as the artist, it was so simple. Because I just did my part. Usually I do my poems with the music, like we did at that live thing, you know. When I'm recording, I usually do it with the music on. I just like to be part of the music, you know. <laughs> it's part of my concept. And then uh, Steve put his imagination to work on it, and he produced the whole thing himself. I thought he did a really great job, I'm really happy. I'd like to do another one of these, you know. Maybe when I finish the next part. But by myself, I could just do them exactly the way I wanted, so that was good for the aesthetics of what I thought. I'm a collaborator because I don't play anything. And yet, I want to hear the music with the poems because they came out of music that I was hearing. So to put them with musicians and hear them surrounded by music makes them have closer to the meaning that I had when I was making it. <laughs> well, in my case, it's, it's key because my poems are composed. They're texts. They're chiseled into paper or whatever, megabytes or whatever. But I mean, they're the same, my poems. Unless I fuck up and leave a part out or miss a word or something. But they're supposed to be the same every time. The music is always different. So that's what makes it exciting to me. And the music part also, I think, I think, this is a foundation of my belief, but I think it makes it easier for people to hear some poetry if there's music with it. In my case, I work very hard conceptually and in practice to make them blend, be, the, be on the same. I say that because a lot of times you hear people reading poetry to music and neither one of them have any idea what the other is doing and there's no congruence artistically between the music and the poems. But in my case, that's the basis of my conception is to make the music and the poem match, you know? So collaborating with a lot of different, and I've collaborated with a lot of different people because when I travel and perform, there's not enough money in this racket to take my own band with me. So I play with different people wherever I go, which again is one of the thrills. This is one of the reasons I do it because it's so much fun to meet these new musicians and hear what they say. And to hear my poems with a different musical track, it's, uh, keeps it really interesting for me. Otherwise, I get sick of these fucking poems because I heard them, you know? <laughs> but when you hear them with some different music, it's a different work. It's the same text, but it's a different work. So yeah, the collaboration means a lot, everything to me, really. I like to compose them, but even in the oh, last long time since I started doing, since the early 80s, I think, when I started this work. And I kind of had felt like I mastered my form. And I could, if I wanted to write something, I could write that what I wanted to write. So ever since then, uh, I forgot what I was saying now. <laughs> to be able to do the shit right after about 20 years of grappling with it, 
finally I figured out how to make this shit work, you know, for me. I started making records in 1991. I was 50. I started making records when I was 50. <laughs> And I've made uh, probably average of a record every year. I've got about, on uh, my CD baby site, I just put up, I'm just putting up the 20th, which was my first one. And they're all different, which I kind of pride myself on them. <laughs> but I started with the recording of the first of the 20 monk works from the Book of Monk, of which this is a sequel. And I've recorded with an eight-piece jazz band in concert. That was my second record. I have my own band in New Orleans with a horn section. And that was my record. We recorded that band live in New Orleans on DAT, the very early days of digital recording. I realized that you could just put up a mic and get the whole thing. One of my best records I made with Wayne Kramer and a horn section from Detroit. We made it in Los Angeles and I recorded live with the music. And that's called Full Circle. That was really, each one is different. That's my, you know, I have my blues work, Fattening Frogs for Snakes. It's in four parts like the monk work and I've recorded all four parts of it with four different ensembles in four different places. <laughs> Two of them in Mississippi. This is interesting. I haven't made a record like this where I recorded the mu the where I recorded the verses and then the music came afterwards. So uh, I don't know. I just think about all these records. I look at the pictures of them. And uh, if you take the aggregate number of people that are represented on these albums, it's a lot of people, a lot of musicians. And jazz musicians, blues musicians, rock and roll musicians. I did a couple, I did one with a hip hop duo in Amsterdam where they made the music and produced the whole record for me. <laughs> I made a record in Detroit with a 15-piece improvisational orchestra called Pink Eye. 15-piece improvisational orchestra. They start with a noise and then they create something together. Pretty exciting. I had a ball with them. <laughs> And then I had a couple of records, well, like the one with Wayne Kramer, and then I made one in Detroit five or six years ago, where I used all poems that had Detroit in them. And I made it with guys that I've been playing with for 30 years in Detroit. So that was my Detroit. I felt I nailed that one down pretty good. Well, I must have met Steve when he started working at the 420 Cafe. I can't remember, but it must have been when he started working there. And the 420 Cafe, as you know, is my headquarters in Amsterdam. I'm the poet in residence. And the important part to me is they play my records at the jukebox. Now, I can't say that about any other place you might go in the world, but if you go to the 420 Cafe, I'm big on the jukebox. I'm like Chuck Berry, you know. <laughs> and you're sitting there having your coffee and having your smoke and one of my records comes on. That thrills the hell out of me, you know. So Steve knew who I was. See, I'm in Amsterdam for two or three months and then I either go over here to London or around Europe or I go back to the States for about half a year, three months at a time. So I come back to Amsterdam and there's different people and stuff, so I mean, so I think I'm sure that's how I met Steve. When I met him, he said he was a DJ and he was doing some DJ nights, Cafe Belgique. 
So I went to hear him play records, and he played really good records. And then they revealed that he was also a drummer. So I went to hear him play with Vince, the guitar player. And he was a good drummer. <laughs> and then he gradually revealed also as uh, that he's an author, that he writes voluminously, that he has several websites for his creativity. He introduced me uh, conceptually to his friend Chu, the great artist, told me of their collaborations, showed me his works, brought him to Amsterdam. 